present. Hey, just a couple of uh, uh, announcements. Uh, Ladies Bible Study begins this Wednesday morning at uh, 9 o'clock for breakfast, all right? This is just for ladies, right? Yes. Am I invited? No. no. Okay. <laughs> ladies Bible Study at 9.30 for the study, but 9 o'clock for breakfast right down here in the Fellowship Hall. Bobby, you want to mention something about that? I just wanted to say that this is Would you stand up, Bobby, please? <laughs> That's this coming Wednesday. We've been waiting all summer for this. Yeah. It's going to be a great study. Uh, that's announcement number one. Hey, we have a lot of visitors here this morning. If you are a visitor, there's a card right in front of the, um, right where you're looking. It says, that white card, Tim, hold it up. And if you could fill that information out for us, it just gives us a record of your attendance. It will keep you apprised of what's happening here. And if for some unforeseen reason we have to cancel something, you'll get notice of that as well. I promise you we're not using that to raise money, anything like that, but we would have a, uh, like to have a record of your having been with us here uh, this morning. And it is good to have you. September 1st, can you believe it? It's September. School has started. I was going to ask all the kids, are you glad school started? <laughs> not a one of them went like this. <laughs> it's all like that. I know my grandkids are the same way. Uh, except it's football season, and we went to a football game on Friday night. Liberty won last night, and uh, how many were at the Liberty game? Anybody? Yeah, you guys were. They won last night, and so a uh, little bit of a lightning delay, right? Uh, but that's okay. Jefferson Forest won on Friday night. My two grandsons are playing. How does Stanton River do? They won. Did they win? Yeah. What was the score? I know every detail about that. That's okay. But they won, right? And that's great. And Liberty yeah. Christian Academy won. What's that? Liberty Christian Academy won their ball game also. All right. Yeah, this is awesome. Man. This is great. What a way to start September off. <laughs> anyway, we've, uh, we started uh, studying uh, the book of 1 Corinthians. Uh, as you know, we go verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And so we're going to finish up 1 Corinthians chapter 1 uh, this morning. So why don't you go ahead and turn uh, in your Bibles there. And I encourage everyone, if you have a pen and if you have your Bibles, don't be afraid to mark up your Bibles. Uh, I, know, I don't know about you, but when I go back over what I had read previously, and if there are notes there, it helps me to remember uh, some of the important things about what I'm reading about. And so don't be afraid to do that. Or if you have a highlighter, go ahead and do that. Uh, you remember Paul had, um, had planted this church on his second missionary journey. Uh, and it was, uh, it was a church that was going through some uh, internal problems. Uh, and there were issues that were going on within this particular church that were being ignored. And because of that, the church was in danger of being uh, torn apart. Uh, because uh, of these issues. And so what Paul does, three years later, after having planted this church, on his third missionary journey from the city of Ephesus, he then writes to this church in Corinth uh, and deals with those particular issues. Uh, and one of those issues were divisions in the church. I'm not going to ask for a raising of hands, but how many of you have ever been in a church in which there were divisions, there were opposing opinions, and even split the church apart? And so this church was in danger of this happening to, and so Paul addresses this up front, and it mainly had to do with what leader that they were following. Some were following the Apostle Paul, some were following Peter, uh, others were following Apollos because he was a great orator, and of course the spiritual ones were following Jesus. And Paul says, that's it, stop the arguing, enough of the divisions, and uh, lay aside the pettiness. And that's what Satan does, does he not? It's usually petty things, it's usually silly things that creep up. And one side takes this side and the other side is over here. 
And then you have this petty uh, argument going on. And Paul closes the first section. He says, listen, the important thing is not who you follow man-wise, but the important thing is you follow Jesus Christ. And you follow the cross because the cross is the power of God. Preach the gospel. That's our message. That's our message here, the, go the gospel of Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection, and soon return of Jesus. That must always be the central message of the church. Jesus himself said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. And so that's the same today. When you lift up the name of Jesus Christ, people would be then drawn to that. And so Paul says the important thing is to preach the gospel. And then he talks about, and we looked at this last week, the wisdom of man versus the wisdom of, of God. And uh, they were following man's wisdom. Uh, we're going to follow this person. We're going to follow this person. And this had been Israel's mistake time and time and time again throughout their history. Listening to man's reasoning instead of listening to the voice of God. We've all done that, right? We've all listened to the voice of man instead of, hey, you know what, let me, let me find out what God has to say about this uh, particular issue. And because Israel had relied on man's wisdom time and time and time again, it had gotten them uh, into trouble. And that's the same thing with us as believers. When we take our focus off the Lord Jesus Christ and we place them on man's wisdom, then we begin developing this mindset of, of carnal thinking, of, of earthly thinking, and then we begin making decisions based on those things instead of, of the Word of God. Verse 25, and this is the verse we ended off of last week. Paul says, For the foolishness of God is wiser than man. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. Listen, man's wisdom does not have the answers to life's greatest needs. And what are those things? Love, joy, peace, the feel needed. Listen, man's wisdom can answer none of those things. Only God can do that, right? It's only through the cross of Jesus Christ that man's needs are met. You see, when man is born, there is within him a void. And that void can only be filled with Jesus Christ. And until you do that, the peace that passes all understanding, the joy where Paul or James says, count it all joy, the love uh, for God so loved the world, none of those things can be part of our lives until we meet Jesus Christ. Gary and I were talking earlier, you know, I don't care how many peace accords that they try in the Middle East, there will not be peace in the Middle East until they what? Until they find Jesus Christ. That's why the angel said, peace on earth. Jesus coming as a babe in the manger. Dying on the cross and raising from the dead. That's the only source of peace. Because when I cross that line of faith and I ask Jesus into my heart, the peace that passes all understanding then becomes part of my life. And only through that. And so this is what Paul says, enough of man's wisdom. Let's look to the church of, and the cross of uh, Jesus Christ. Only there will man's greatest needs be met. Don't get sucked in by the world's wisdom. That's my interpretation of that portion. That's what Paul's saying. Hey, listen, don't get, don't get caught in man's wisdom. Look to the Lord Jesus Christ. Look to the Word of God. And so here we are in verse 26. If you look at your Bible, he says this. Again, Paul is talking to the believers. He's talking to a church in which there are problems going on. He is encouraging them, but he's also admonishing them at the same time. And so he tells them here in verse 26, For consider your calling, brothers. So he's talking to believers. Let's stop right there. What is our calling? What is our calling? He's saying, consider your calling. First of all, God has called us to salvation, right? I believe God, there's the picture of God waiting with open arms for everyone. The Bible says, for God so loved the what? The world. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. And so the first call for us as people is to answer that call for salvation and to cross that line of faith and ask Him into our hearts. That's call number one. I believe call number two is for us to live in obedience to Him. <coughs> to live in obedience to Him. 
John tells us in one of his books, he says, and by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. And so God has first of all called me to salvation, and then he has called me then to obedience to the word of God. And then number three, God has called us also to service. To serve Him using the talents and, and gifts and abilities and passions and personality that He has given us and to serve Him. In fact, Paul would tell Timothy, he said, listen Timothy, I called him timid Timothy because he had a tendency to kind of shirt back. And Paul says, listen, stir up the gift of God which is in you. Stir it up. Use it for the glory of God. Listen, God's desire, I believe, for everyone is to establish a relationship, first of all, and then to maintain fellowship with Him, with all those who are willing. And so Paul says, consider your calling, brothers. We just talked about that. He says, not many of you were wise, according to the worldly standards. Not many of you were powerful. Not many of you were noble birth. So he's asking them to go back to when you first were called by Jesus Christ. What were you? He said not many of you were wise. In other words, highly skilled. Were a philosopher. One who has this a great wisdom. Uh, that was important to the inhabitants of Corinth. Because they were all about wisdom. He says, not many of you were wise when you answered the call from Jesus. Not many of you were influential or powerful. Not many of you had a lot of money. Not many of you were influential in the culture in which you lived. Not many of you were of noble birth. In other words, if you were born a Roman, man, you were, I mean, you were a step above everyone else. And Paul is saying, not many of you were any of those things. Think back about your, your own life. Uh, what were you? How many of you were a famous Hollywood actor? How about a famous athlete? Anyone? How about a popular politician? Anyone like that in here? Think back. None of us were any of, of those. I'm from Williamstown, New Jersey. <laughs> I know a couple that know where Williamstown, New Jersey is. I mean, it's some town out in the middle of nowhere. It's a suburb of Cecil. There you go. Uh, I mean, you know where Cecil is. Now we know where it is. <laughs> there you go. I knew I would pinpoint it. And, and I also went to a college back in the early 70s in which there wasn't even a campus. Of course, now it's Liberty University. But back then, I mean, I had no heritage. I had no heritage looking back. The only heritage I have is the fact that I crossed that line of faith and asked Jesus into my heart. But when I look back, I mean, I was nothing. I was nothing. I said, this is... This is what Paul is telling, not many of you are wise, not many of you are powerful, not many of you were of, of noble birth. And so if we were to be honest, if we look back at our heritage, you know what, it's not something that people are going to write in the paper and about, it's going to be trumpeted all over the media. But these are the people that God calls, right? I'm thankful that he called me from that heritage, from that existence. Why did he do it? But God says this. But God shows, verse 27, but God shows what is foolish in the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen what is weak in the world to, uh, to shame the strong. And so he begins to compare right here. He says, listen, um, uh, God shows what is foolish. That word foolish means to be dull or to be absurd. Or to put it in modern language, to be a blockhead. How many of you ever heard of that term? That term. Not many of you were blockheads in the world, but he chose what is foolish to shame of the wise, to make the wise feel ashamed. This is what Paul is saying here. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. I mentioned this verse last week. And this is God speaking. He says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God chose what is foolish 
in the world to shame the wise. God shows what is weak in the world to shame the strong. That word weak means to be sickly or to be without strength. And so God has chosen the sickly of the world to shame those who are strong. Verse next, verse 28. And God shows what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. And so Paul continues on. God has also chosen the lowly, those who are lowborn, those who are low on the totem pole. How many of you are there? That's me. I'm just low on the totem pole. That's who I am. God shows them to nullify or to bring to nothing the things that are. And then God chose the things that are not, those who go unnoticed, those who don't get picked for the team when there is a raising of the hand. God chose those to make the others go unnoticed. You see what Paul is doing here. And why does he do that? Verse 29. This is the one that you need to underline or highlight. So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. The Bible says in what? Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by what you are saved? For by grace you are saved through faith. And that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works. Why? Because if I could work my way, then I would have reason to boast. And I don't think there's anybody, in fact, I don't think, I know there's not going to be anybody that's going to stand before Jesus Christ and say, you know what, I have reason to go to heaven because of what I've done. Jesus is going to do what? Depart from me, I never knew you. Because there's nothing that I can do to earn salvation. Jesus did it all by that free gift of grace. And then I lift up my, my head and my eyes to Him and I accept that free gift by faith. It's nothing that I can do. It's nothing that I have done. The author says this, The Corinthians had a tendency to be puffed up with pride. But God's grace leaves no room for personal boasting. God is not impressed with our looks. God is not impressed with our social positions or our achievements, our natural heritage, or our financial status. The world admires all of those things. But none of those things can save them. None of those things are important to God. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that I don't have to be any of those things to be included in His family? It's only through what Jesus did for me on the cross. Mm -hmm. Salvation, listen, salvation must be holy of grace. Otherwise, God cannot get the glory. And this is Paul point, Paul's point to them. If we glory in men, Paul or Apollos or Peter, if we glory in men, we are robbing of God of the glory that He alone deserves. It was this sinful attitude of pride, the lifting up of men, that was fostering division in this church. How many of you through the years... Um, heard about religious leaders who kind of blew it through the years and then as a result thousands of people left the church why because they had their eyes on who they had their eyes on the man instead of their eyes on Jesus Christ Paul says no more divisions take your eyes off of man take your eyes off of me place your eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ this is what he's saying here and so Paul's saying, this is what you were. This is what you were. Uh, people who were absurd. People who were blockheads, so to speak. People who were sickly, who were of humble origin. And guess what? The Bible is full of them. That's what I love about the Bible, because there are many characters that I can pull out and I can identify with them. Why? Because they're human just like me. I think there's sometimes a tendency to deify the characters that we read in the Bible, and that's that's us placing our eyes on them, right? But it's us learning from that. Let's look at some of the biblical examples. What about Noah? The culture of his day believed Noah to be what? A little crazy, right? Who is this idiot building a boat out in the middle of nowhere? God told Noah to build a what? 
to build a boat or to build it an ark. How many years did it take him to do it, Garrett? Over a hundred, right? Over a hundred. Over a hundred years to build that boat. You can imagine day after day after day after day building this boat and the people around you making fun of you because of something this supposed God told you to do because a flood is coming. It had never rained before. God watered the ground from the dew of the earth. It hadn't rained. What are you talking about, Noah? Back Genesis um, says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God told him to do something, and Noah began to do it. Second Peter says that he preached righteousness. So as the people were ridiculing him as he was building this big boat, he was preaching to them righteousness. Listen, you need to repent. You need to turn from your sin and join us in the ark because a great rain is coming. What a foolish man he was. In the world's eyes, right? What about Moses? If you look at Moses, he couldn't speak. He was a stutterer. He didn't know how to put two words together. Early on, he was living in luxury and privilege because he had been brought up in, in, in Pharaoh's court. But because he murdered an Egyptian, he was sent out into the desert, and there he was a shepherd for 40 years until he met the burning bush. And he listened to the voice of that burning bush. But yet he listened, but it went out the other ear. What did he do? Moses made excuse time after time. Who am I to lead these people? Jesus said, I'll go with you. But what if they ask, who has sent me to do this? Well, just tell them I am has sent you. Well, I have never been eloquent. I'm not, I'm a slow of speech, God, God says. And who gave man his mouth? Who makes him deaf or mute? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go. I'll help you speak, and I will teach you what to say. What did Moses say? Ah, send somebody else. And so God raises up Aaron to go along with him. And of course, we see as we read through the book of Exodus, the slow transformation as Moses appears before Pharaoh ten different times, and all of a sudden the boldness begins to come in, and God uses him uh, to deliver several million people from the hands of Pharaoh and on into toward the promised land. What a meek, weak man he was. What a meek, weak man he was. What about Gideon's army? You remember the story of Gideon? Uh, the Midianites had uh, amassed by the tens of thousands their army uh, to do battle against, against Israel. And so uh, Gideon garners an army of 32,000 men in this man. We may have a chance against this vast army. And God looks down and says, there's too many. And so Gideon says, you know what, if you're scared, if you have to go to your family, go ahead and leave. And uh, what, 22,000 left? And so he's left now with 10,000, and Gideon's thinking, okay, we're a little outnumbered here, but we can still win this battle. And God looks down and says, what? Well, you still have too many. And so they gave him a test down by the lake, those who lapped the water versus those who did it from, uh, from standing up. And God said, those are the men I want. So Gideon ends up with how many men? 300. 300. And God says, this is who I'm going to have the victory with. What a small, insignificant army that was. That's what they were. And then there's Samson. Oh gosh, the story of Samson. The Spirit of God was with him, we read in, in the book of Judges. But he had a weakness. What was that? He had a weakness with women. That was his downfall. And so you remember, uh, because of Delilah, the, 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 you know the story. And so if he's finally taken prisoner, they take his eyes out, and now he's a prisoner grinding at the mill until his hair begins to grow. And then one more time, he prays. And uh, while the Philistines are uh, celebrating there in the temple, the temple of Dagon, and you remember Samson puts each arm on those pillars and, and the temple came crashing down. The Bible says he killed many more when he died than while he lived. I put in my nose, what a blockhead he was. <laughs> he was, right? 
What about David? David was the least likely to succeed. Israel had a need for a king. They had already elected Saul. He was a failure. And so Samuel was sent out to the town of Bethlehem to the house of Jesse. And, and so Samuel had Jesse parade all of his sons uh, before him because God had told Samuel that the king would come from the family of Jesse. And so the three oldest ones were the first ones. I mean, they were built, they were tall. And, and man, Samuel said, man, those guys have to be the ones. And God says, no, man doesn't look, man looks at the outward appearance, but God what? God looks at the heart. And so all of the sons passed before him, and Samuel's thinking something's wrong here. Jesse, do you have one more son? Oh, well, yeah, we have one. He's kind of insignificant. He's out there taking care of the sheep. And so he was made to come in, and of course there Samuel anoints him as king to be of course, you know the story, David before Goliath, and uh, David's boldness is there through the Spirit of God. Goliath, you've come before me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. This day the Lord will hand you over to me. David would spend 13 years on the run for his very life because Saul was jealous over him. Saul knew that David would eventually become king. David, what a nothing he was. He was. What about Jonah? Jonah was a loser on the run, right? God had called Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach the gospel to them. And uh, Jonah said, no way, I'm not going to go. Those Ninevites are, are evil. Do you know what they have done to the nations around them? In fact, they would go and they would conquer a town and they would pile up all of the skulls at the entrance to the town so people knew that Assyria was there. God is calling Jonah to go uh, and preach righteousness to Nineveh. Of course, we know what happened. He ran the other way. Uh, he got on board. There was this tremendous storm. Jonah said, eh, I'm guilty. They throw him overboard. And then a fish had man dinner. A man didn't have fish dinner. It was the opposite way. So Jonah was in the belly of the whale how many days? Three days. Until he finally prayed. Read the book of Jonah. Awesome. He prayed. And so the whale vomited him out. I can imagine what that looked like or smelled like. They say that the, because of the acid in the whale of the stomach that Jonah came out actually bleached in an unbelievable way. And so when he arrived in Nineveh, people were already impressed with his looks. But then he preached and there was revival in the city of Nineveh, including the king. <coughs> what a rebel Jonah was. Was. What about Peter? Peter was a denier, right? Uh, he hung with Jesus, spent three years with Jesus, saw all of the miracles and, and saw all that and heard everything that Jesus had taught. And, and in spite of all of the above, when it comes right down to it, and Jesus is before uh, the, the, uh, the, the leaders there, Peter denies Jesus three times. Luke tells us that Jesus looked around at Peter. Peter went out and, and wept bitterly. But then after Pentecost, who was the first to preach? It was Peter. He was the one that preached the gospel message. And 3,000 people came to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Peter's life was transformed. But what a weak and cowardly man he was. He was. What about Paul? Gosh, uh, the Apostle Paul, he was a murderer, right? He was a persecutor of the church. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. And he believed that he was serving God. And this new sect, uh, this <coughs> church of the way, these followers of Jesus Christ, you know, they're going against the law. So Paul would go from house to house and arrest, arrest men and women and children. And, and so he received a letter from the religious leaders to go into Damascus. And there he would arrest believers there and bring them back to Jerusalem have them in prison or killed. Of course, you know the story. On the way, Paul meets Jesus Christ, and his life is transformed. His life was transformed. What a proud person he was. He was. And of course, there's Jesus. <coughs> there's Jesus. Born in a manger, not some place a king would be born. Would he raised, be raised in Nazareth? You remember Nathaniel? Can anything good come from Nazareth? This despised town? 
the carpenter's son, and this guy is the Messiah? Philippians 2, verse, from verse 5 to 11. Let me read this passage. You're familiar with it. Philippians 2, verse 5 to 11 says this. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. And being born in the likeness of men, and being found then in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So at the name of Jesus, what? Every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What a loser Jesus was in the eyes of the world. In the eyes of the world. What were you when Jesus called you? How many of you were from Hollywood? How many of you were famous athletes? How many of you were a tremendous politician in, in Washington, D.C., or, or Richmond, Virginia, or Trenton, New Jersey? <laughs> no, we were none of these things. We were fools, right? We were not wise. Look at verse 30. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus. I love that. If you have your Bibles, circle that word in because that's the important word. Because of God the Father, I am, you are in Christ Jesus. In other words, you have established a relationship with God the Father because of Jesus. Who became to us, to us, wisdom from God. And then he mentions three things. Righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. There's the threefold process of salvation right there. Righteousness, listen, when we cross that line of faith, we then have become justified before God the Father. Not because of anything that I have done, but because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We have been saved from the penalty of sin. That's what righteousness is. I have been clothed then with the righteousness of Jesus Christ when I ask Him in the Bible. Then he says, sanctification. That's the holy process. That's the being set apart process. You see, my spirit is saved immediately. I'm justified before him. But my soul is in the midst of being saved as time moves on. That's why Paul says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Be being transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so as I live my life, I am being sanctified. I am being set apart. I am becoming Coming more like Him, I am being saved from the power of sin. And then Paul uses this third word, redemption. Um, that's my future. That's my future. I have a home in heaven. I will be saved from the presence of sin. Why? Because to be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord. And then I'll be free from sin. The sin debt, the sting of death will no longer be there. Because of what Jesus did. Hey, listen. Paul says this in verse 31. So that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. That's who we need to brag on. We need to brag on Jesus Christ. Why? Because of everything that He's given and done for me. He has saved me. I am justified before Him. I'm in the midst of being saved. I'm becoming more like Him. And I will be saved. Man, this body is going to take on a new body. And I'm going to be made anew. And I'll be with Jesus Christ forever and ever and ever. In the wisdom of God, the plan of salvation was accomplished by a crucified Christ. Hidden from the wise and learned, but revealed to us. Just simple belief. How many of you are simple believers? Just me. Just simple. But I've crossed that line of faith. All of us are here this morning not because of our financial status, 
not because of how important that we are or how important or valuable my heritage is or because I've accomplished anything great. None of us are here for that. But we're here this morning because of what he has done. And many of you, if not most of you, have crossed that line of faith. You have asked Jesus into your heart. And you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you belong to him. And that you have a home in heaven. And there is no greater peace than that. Amen. You see, we live in a morally and spiritually bankrupt world that considers Christians to be losers. It considers Christians to be blockheads. How many of you have family members like that? You're crazy. Or co-workers. Or classmates. You're crazy for being a believer. Ted Turner. How many of you ever heard the name Ted Turner? He's worth about $2.5 billion a day. He called Christians losers. And bozos. He said in a spirit speech to the American Humanist Association, Christianity is a religion for losers. But the real loser is Ted Turner. He has been married and divorced three times. He has uh, diagnosed as a manic depressive. He drinks too much and is a bitter, depressed man, even though he's worth over $2 billion. As a young boy, Ted Turner had intended to become a missionary. Instead, today, he's bitter, he's anti-Christian. He even says at times he feels like committing suicide. Elvis Presley, you've heard of him, was one of the most popular entertainers in his time and history. He had fame and all of the money that he could buy, but he died losing from an overdose of drugs. I was in Nashville when, when that happened. Many of his days were days of great depression <laughs> and misery. That great actress of old, Joan Crawford, when she was near death, her housekeeper began to pray for her, and Joan Crawford cursed at her and said, Don't you dare ask God to help me. Frank Sinatra. Hey, from Jersey, South Philly. Won the hearts of millions, known for his, one of his hit songs, I Did It My Way said that when he died, he wanted a bottle of whiskey buried with him. His last words were, I'm losing. Margaret Sanger, founder of Planned Parenthood, his last words were, a party, let's have a party. I don't think she's partying today. I believe she hears the cries of tens of millions of babies who are dancing with Jesus. What about you? What were you? How many of you were blockheads? How many of you were losers? Noah was a crazy man. Moses was a stutterer, no self-esteem. Gideon was small in numbers. Samson's greatest victory, well, he was blind. David, least likely to succeed. Jonah, loser on the run. Peter a denier, Paul a murderer. Listen, God calls everyone and will use anyone, listen, whose heart is willing. Jim Dennison, and we'll close with this, Jim Dennison served as a summer missionary in East Malaysia. During one of their worship services, a teenage girl shared her faith in that small warehouse that was used for a church. She was baptized that day in their baptistry, which was just a small bathtub. And she just simply glowed with the love of Christ. While all of this was going on, Dennison noticed some worn out luggage leaning against the wall. He asked a church member for an explanation of the suitcase, and he pointed to the girl who had just been baptized and said her father told her that if she was baptized as a Christian, she could never go home again. Mm -hmm. So she brought her luggage. What a challenge for greater commitment. <laughs> I think the challenge this morning is, is threefold. Number one, challenges 
Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? If somehow today, unfortunately, you would, you would pass out into eternity, you would not make it home, do you know where you would go? The Bible says, These things I have written unto you, that you may know that you have eternal life. You see, the person who is a true believer knows 100% that to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you know that this morning? May I know that? I know where I go. The way I drive, it could be sooner than later. <laughs> the challenge is, do you know Jesus Christ? And then the second challenge is, is this, are you living in obedience to Him? He said, well, what does that mean? Well, when I open up the Word of God, and this is what the Word of God says, and because God says it, then I'm going to move in that direction. That's what being obedient is. Am I being obedient to Him? And then the third challenge is, am I serving Him? I mean, I'm looking across, I don't know how many people will be here, but every one of you has gifts. Every one of you have talents. Every one of even the kids, I don't care how old or how young you are, you have abilities in which you can serve the Lord. I don't know how much time we have left. Gary has a Revelation class at 930, and the more I study Revelation, the more I am convinced that we are definitely living in the very end times. I don't know how much longer we have. It's exciting to the believer. But on the other end, it's not as exciting because I know there are people who don't know Jesus Christ. And so the question I ask myself, if I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that the rapture would happen at 3 o'clock today, how would I live differently? That's a pointed question. Would I be on the phone? I think I would. Would I go next door to my neighbors on either side? I think I would. They may call me crazy. They may call me a blockhead. But I think I would. But how do we know that he won't? How do we know that Jesus won't return before we're even done the service? Before we eat that, that lunch that smells awful good from here? <laughs> Do you know Jesus Christ? Are you living in obedience to Him? And are you serving Him? And that's the challenge this morning. Uh, if you don't come back, I know many of you are visiting here this morning. If you don't come back, remember those three things. Those are three important things that God has called us all to do. I mean, I don't, and again, I don't care if you're in school, if you're in classes, you can live for Jesus Christ right there in, in class. I may not be able to say the things that, um, that I should be saying. But may I can live for Jesus Christ in my family. I mean, some of you may have unsafe spouses. Some of you may have problems at home. Maybe neighbors that get on your nerves. But you know what? I can be Jesus to them. They, I may be the only Jesus that they see or hear. That's tough. I don't want to live like that sometimes. That's what God has called us to do. Are we serving Him? I hope you are. I know that when I'm doing those things, I cannot be in any more peace than I am when I'm doing those things. There is no greater satisfaction to the believer of knowing Jesus, of, of being obedient to Him, and serving Him. There is no greater satisfaction. That's where I want to be. Do I always do it? That's where I want to stay. That's where I want to be. I want to challenge you to do so as well. This bell is, and why don't we stand as, as we do that? I do want to ask the question, though, do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? If you don't know Him, you can know Him right now, right where you're standing. You say, well, how can I know Him? just ask him Lord I want to know you how do I do that believe that he loves you believe that he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for you 
Say, God, here's my life. I turn my life over to you. Forgive me of my sin then, Lord. Now help me to know that I belong to you. You say, is it that simple? Yeah, it is. Except billions of people are missing it. Pray that prayer right now where you are. Lord, I believe you. I believe that you love me. I believe you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for me. Father, forgive me of my sin, Dad. I realize I can, I can only know you through Jesus Christ. Now, Father, help me to know that I belong to you right now. Right before we close in prayer, if you prayed that prayer this morning, would you just do me a favor? Just raise your hand. And by raising your hand, you're saying, Buzz, you know, I prayed that prayer this morning. I ask Jesus in my heart. Is anyone like that? Anyone? Father, we're so thankful, Lord, for your love to us. Lord, I thank you for Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you for your word. Gosh, Lord, I thank you for that. Thank you that it's just as relevant today, Lord, as it was when it was penned through the Holy Spirit, Father, thousands of years ago. Father, may we live in obedience to you. Lord, may we serve you. There are so many people who need Jesus, Father, and we may be the only message that gets that across. Strengthen us this day, Father. Lord, thank you for everyone that is here this morning, Father. Thank you, um, Lord, that they know you. Go with us this day, Father. Grant us safety in all that we say and all that we do. In your precious name. Everyone said, Amen. Mm -hmm.